a lot of people have been asking, Winkly, how do you overclock your i9 12900K and how exactly do you get it up to such a low latency for playing competitive games? Well, today, let's get deep into that topic and how I managed to get my 12900K onto a locked 4.8 GHz all-core cache and memory overclock to the point where it's synchronized in both the memory, the L3 cache, and the actual CPU cores itself. All at a temperature maximum of about 83 degrees centigrade on AVX2 full load or Linpack Extreme. Memory latency is absolutely hoarse and uh, yeah, we're just looking at the middle of the pack here. Turbo at 4.8 average. That's pretty alright. Memory is running at a latency of 75 nanoseconds, which is pretty garbage for what these sticks actually are. Here we have already 93 degrees running on just the 16 threads here out of the 8P cores. These things are very, very toasty this generation around, and 13th gen, thank god, has actually gone down a lot in temperature and very, very much up in efficiency. So this is going to be our baseline. now. Since we are base clock overclocking, you would assume everything's all well and good, but base clock overclocking is a bit more challenging than just normal overclocking. What you need to do is find the base clock chip and slap a heatsink right on top of it because it is needed. Without this, this thing will never stabilize at a clock speed higher than say 5.0 GHz. It will be overheating, just a bit. I think it's running at like 70 degrees or so, and of course, you'll need a 360mm radiator at the least. So my personal recommendation is, if you don't care about longevity, get a Corsair. If you care about longevity, get something from Deepcool. They are really, really high quality coolers. Get the Castle V2. The Castle V2 has the taller fin stacks on the cold plate itself. It also has a ceramic pump bearing, which is incredibly high quality. It has a bellows system in order to prevent any issues from uh, the liquid expanding on a high heat, which is a big concern this generation. Okay, so starting off, we're gonna set a 4.8 gigahertz all-core lock. Now, this is lower than the default, for sure, and we're actually gonna disable all the e-cores as well, because remember, the more cores you have, and the lower the cache clock that you're running it at, is gonna cause overall lower system responsiveness. We're running Ghost Spectre in this system, we're gonna leave all this and it will set the maximum wattage to about 4,000 or so. Light load, you need to set this. By default, this number can vary from 1 to 80, and 80 means your CPU is gonna overheat. The lower the number, the less load line is gonna apply, and if the BIOS decides one day to turn to one, you might get that strange lag at the start. You need this to be somewhere in the middle. It can't be 80, remember, it will overheat, and it can't be one, because none of those are really gonna be good ideas out of the bag. All right, so we're running hyper-threading enabled, all that. Dynamic mode is going to go to fixed mode. We're gonna set the multiplier to 4T. Now remember, this is a base clock OC. So we're gonna set both of these to 48. So setting all these to 40 would make some sense. I'm gonna set the base clock to 120 after we enable the XMP profile. Just go to the XMP profile here. So with your own sticks, your mileage may vary. You're probably not gonna be able to reach 4,800 off the bat on DDR4. If you have the DDR5 version of this motherboard, that is a better idea. We're gonna need the DRAM reference clock to be on 100, new CPU IMC, need to set to gear two in order to reach anything past 4,000 megahertz. More often than not, especially if you're on a motherboard that has slightly worse memory tracing than this board, which is already, if not one of the best memory tracers that you can get on the market today. This is why I chose this over some other Z690 motherboards from Gigabyte or uh, from ASRock. They do a really good job with shielding the board. There is a full layer of copper above and below the memory tracers. This is the deep cool cooler here. We got two pipes running out from underneath the cooler because the cold plate direction has the fin stacks running all across the CPU like this. Otherwise you'll have issues when it runs down like this because it will get colder at the top and hotter at the bottom. You want it to be colder at the side, hotter on the other side. Most water coolers let you do that. It will drop your temperatures by about 10 degrees and level out the core-to-core -core temperatures by about five degrees. 
Now I know, yes, this is against uh, actual hardcore overclocking's recommendations of putting the radiator lower than the CPU, but hey, that's the only ergonomic way that I'm going to be able to do it, apart from putting it on the top, I just don't want to do that. I'm doing push-pull here, if I do push-pull on the top, it's going to slam into the heatsink, it's going to look really bad. This is a good cooler, it's going to be topped up for a long time, it doesn't really matter, and I can service it quickly. These are the two sticks of RAM, Team T-Force 4800s, and they don't take much, if at all, voltage to do it. It's only 1.55 volts that I'm able to get this running. That's that. Uh, let's start moving on to the memory timings. Now, uh, these all set fairly well. I'm going to set this down to 19, 25, 25, and 45 because they are stable at these exact timings. Now, you can mess with all the rest if you want, but uh, from what I find, just turn off the power down mode and uh, leave everything else to default. As far as it's needed right now, we're sweet. Disable fast boot. Very critical here. If you have fast boot on, there's a high chance that your memory just will boot unstably maybe one out of uh, five times and you'll have like really horrible input lag. You want load line calibration as low as possible. As per, once again, check out actually Hardcore Overclocking's channel. You need to have a look at that. Switching frequency. Higher is not actually better. If you have a board that's from uh, MSI, set it to 500. Don't go above 500. The higher you go, the more unstable the voltage is. In fact, you'll get random spikes really low on the voltage graph if you move your mouse on 1000 kilohertz. All it does is raises your VRM temperatures, unless you're maybe pushing for like 60 hertz on LN2 or some crazy numbers like that, it still has no point. So on CPU core voltage, we're going to set this to 1.25. We're going to go to the memory frequency and we need to set this to 4000 G2, DRM reference clock is 100, and you want to set the base clock to 120, and when you set it to 120, what it's going to do is bring up the DRAM frequency to 4.8. Once again, fast boot is off, and uh, I do have a few extra hold settings here, which are the TRFC, the TREFI, the T4, the TRRD, and RDL. Now for Hynix CJR chips, these settings are going to be stable all the way up to about 4.8 GHz. Override mode on the core is 1.25 volts. You need to set these though, these are very important. The SA voltage is going to be your memory controller. Same idea between these two, the SA and the VDDQ, so I think VDDQ used to be more the VCC IO voltage and this used to be more the VCC SA voltage. This generation, you can have them pretty much one to one, it's not a big concern. Just copy these settings down for your 12900K, make sure your temperatures aren't hitting over 85 degrees on the overclocked full load. VDDQ can go all the way up to 1.6 or so without degrading, but then again, I wouldn't set voltages as high as that, because that's just stupid. CPU AUX is for the VRM input, you want this to be slightly raised so it stays very stable on high load. And the CPU 1.05 is just the chipset voltage, you don't touch that. The second chipset voltage is also locked. You want to keep these locked, and VTT is just whatever the bars really wants to set it to. DRAM voltage and eventual needs to be the same exact number. CPU features, we have everything enabled except for CPU ID maximum, active view cores is zero, P cores all. You got to enable your 4G resize bar, otherwise what are you doing with your money? And you do see improvements of about 10, 20 FPS. That's just one more thing, check all the hardware monitor controls. Every BIOS will have a fan control menu, usually it's going to be on the hardware monitor section. And you can see here, this is the CPU fan, this is not the pump fan. The front set of three fans here, and the top set of three fans, are uh, between this and system fan 4. So, depending on where you're connecting the fans on the controllers on the board, they're going to coordinate with the uh, settings at the top here. So, each cluster of fans here, I've connected to a hub of three and they're all getting control from system 4 and pump 1 and the CPU itself is the pump this is set to PWM because if you set it to DC this is what happens it just turns off so I'm leaving it on max speed here PWM is 2700 RPM very good liquid circulation this is the uh, fan curve that you should ideally go for voltage on the left here the uh, temperatures on the bottom so for some reason deep cools fans also like uh, DC control so let's save and lock that there, and we've got our new profile. Off the bat, you'll be uh, maybe surprised to see that the system is taking maybe an extra boot cycle here to train everything up. Now, you're possibly going to see that there is a LED here indicating the boot 
where it's going through and it's either going to be a code or it's going to be a set of LEDs. It might add another boot cycle to that cycle itself. It will take a bit to uh, boot all the way up and then try to train the RAM. So this amber light should disappear and the white light should now come on. And when you set fast boot to off, that white light is going to take a lot longer than usual. Booting up straight off the bat, you're going to see that the, uh, the lag is a lot less if you actually lock in that CPU uh, light load setting, not as low as one or two, you don't really get that audio stutter when you start up anything. Uh, turning off the FTPM also helps if you're on just Windows 10 and don't really care, because the on-die TPM it doesn't feel very reliable. Use a discrete TPM, guys, if you can. Here are the final benchmarks here. We're doing 192 on the uh, gaming benchmark and a lot better on everything else here. Memory latency has gone up to 90.8, which is really good out of 100. We're doing 121%, which is not so far off what we just got. Let's see here, the RAM, much, much better, guys. We're going to a latency of just 66 nanoseconds down from 76 if you just left it on default. That's our base clock OC, and remember we have a heatsink on that, so that should hold a lot better. If you don't have a heatsink on this, this number will go up and down dramatically and that will very, very heavily destabilize your OC. You're gonna see that the, uh, the actual core performance, not the cache performance, is gonna suffer a tiny bit because of our so-called slight down clock, but we have gone from a 3.6 effective cache clock to 4.8. It's a huge difference for responsiveness. Now, if you're anywhere familiar with computers, you'll know that cache is more akin to the fast RAM of a PC. And if you've ever worked with Ryzen, Ryzen's cache is large, but it's slow. So it primarily uses RAM. And if you have fast RAM, then the computer as a whole just feels a lot, lot faster, especially if it's got XMP past about 3200 or so. Doesn't matter how fast your memory is, your cache is gonna be more important because network adapters, GPUs, your sound cards, all use the on-die cache as much as they can and delay the processing of your mouse movements. You need to have fast system cache and second to that, you need to have fast system memory. In fact, core clock does not matter as much as we say it does because the, the faster the clock really, it's still waiting for everything else to kind of catch up. And that's why overclocking these days just doesn't really do all that much, except for raise your FPS a tiny bit. Before we go any further, disable sysmain. It really tanks your performance in games and uh, it keeps your Windows reading and writing non-stop to your SSD, to your hard drives, and it just wears them down maybe at like, so instead of getting like 10 years out of your SSD, you might only get five. What it does is it reads crap into your RAM. More VRAM usage, more RAM usage causes your system to feel slower because there's more needles in the haystack, right? The haystack is larger as well. You want your memory usage to be as low as possible. And this Windows image from Ghost Spectre is as good as it gets for that. Running at a chilly 74 degrees on all cores. That is insane. You will not see this out of any stock clocks. 4.8 GHz on all cores, 4.8 GHz on the cache, 4.8 GHz on the RAM. Huge props guys, thanks MSI, you really are the MVP this time around for um, carrying through. One of the best motherboards in its class for base clock overclocking. Um, usually my second choice will be ASRock, sometimes Gigabyte, but they haven't really delivered anything that we can buy in Australia these days. So, suffice to say, I certainly do not regret buying MSI this time around. For the low, low price of $300 Australian, you can get yourself one of these V660M Mortar Maxes, and they are by far best in class. Even if this was a 12900, you'd be pretty much able to get the same thing. Very critical though, do not set the uh, cache clock at the multiplier that you need it at. You have to set it to below 4.0. If you set it above that, what happens is when it goes to full load, it will throttle down the encore. So set the encore low to about 40 on the multiplier or 44 or so, and it will boost the encore like it should instead of throttling it down. And uh, running at command rate 2T, 
because 1T, while it's a uh, low latency, doesn't actually present much of a difference in games. It it gives you better FPS with command rate 2T, surprisingly. There's a lot of benchmarks that show that. But yeah, just take my word for it. And why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the f So these are Hynix CJR sticks of RAM, and they're running at 4800 megahertz. Of you can try for a 5.0 GHz unified OC on this board, but the RAM is an issue. You might need to buy the 5 GHz version or the 5200. And yeah, for all intents and purposes of just playing Tarkov, CSGO, Valorant, this does perfectly fine. The voltages are incredibly low. We're only using 1.14 volts, guys, for a 4.8 or core with 4.8 cache clock. Intel really pulled through this time around. Honestly, on AMD, the L3 cache is actually half of the speed of the cores. Half, guys. So say if you had a CPU, right, of 4.8 gigahertz on AMD, the cache is gonna be running at two gigahertz. The memory controller is running at an effective four gigahertz. On Intel, it's the other way around. If you have a core clock of four gigahertz, you can have a cache clock of whatever you set it to. So in this case, also four gigahertz. On AMD, these are the same, but then this is gonna be half. And remember what I said about Uncore being more important than RAM? Counter-Strike, Valorant, Tarkov, these Twitch shooters, I asked maybe 10, 20 streamers what they thought, and they all said the same thing. Intel is not higher in FPS, but it's faster, it's snappier. And that's what's very important if you're climbing to say Global in CS or Ascendant to Radiant and Valorant, that's important. You don't want to bank yourself on AMD. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. It's been one hell of a journey to get these benchmarks in and compile all these benchmarks into one single video. OCC2 user benchmark, Tarkov, I'll probably get some games in next time, like Counter-Strike, but the numbers will be pretty much identical. You'll see slightly less FPS in some games, if not most of them, and what actually goes up is not something that you can record on a number scale. Responsiveness and import lag does not one-to-one -one correlate with FPS, at least to the levels that we're going at. You really need to have the right memory chips to attempt this, so please check out Team's memory selection. They are incredible. Alright guys, don't forget to drop a like, or I might accidentally drop the bomb over the wall, so... Uh, yeah, see you in the next video, and take care. Have fun with the server clock, and honestly, wish you all luck. Why don't you back it up with a source? My 